cloud. Great. All right, welcome everyone again to the Colorado Wildfires 2020 webinar series. Uh, our first speaker today is going to be Brad White. Chief White came to the Grand County working summers while earning a degree in natural resources management and began his fire career in 2002 as a volunteer firefighter, eventually serving as an assistant chief and then fire chief. Brad came to Grand Fire Protection District in 2014 as the assistant chief of operations and training where he worked to broaden training efforts and opportunities both locally and regionally, and has served as the fire chief since February of 2019. Brad holds certifications in both structural firefighting and wildland firefighting, including instructor certifications, NWCG strike team leader and incident commander type four, and is working towards his incident commander type three. Chief White has been active with the Colorado State Fire Chiefs Association including serving as the vice chair of the volunteer fire chiefs section and two terms as the wildland section chair. Chief White is a founding member of the Grand County Training Officers Association and the Grand County Wildfire Council and has sat on several state and regional committees, including the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control Wildland Advisory Committee, the Craig Interagency Dispatch Advisory Group, and the Colorado State Fire Chiefs Statewide Mutual Aid Committee, working to promote and improve wildfire preparedness, mitigation, resource mobilization, and wildfire response. Our other speaker today is going to be Kevin Johnson. Sergeant Kevin Johnson is the supervisor of the Larimer County Sheriff's Office Emergency Services Unit. The Emergency Services Unit responds to wildland fire, search and rescue, water rescue, severe weather and hazardous materials incidents throughout the country, county, sorry. The unit has four full-time full 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 employees, a five-person initial attack module, 30 on-call wildland firefighters, and over 100 search and rescue dive team volunteers. Sergeant Johnson has been with the Sheriff's Office for 25 years, five years as an emergency communications operator and 20 years with the emergency services unit, the last 15 as the supervisor. Prior to this, Sergeant Johnson worked for 13 years on the Red Feather Ranger District of the Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest in recreation, law enforcement, timber marking and wildland fire. Sergeant Johnson is qualified as a National Wildfire Coordinating Group Incident Commander Type 3, Task Force Leader, and Wildland Fire Cause and Origin Investigator. Sergeant Johnson has an AAS degree in forestry from Paul Smith College and a BS degree in forestry from Colorado State University. That are, those are the introductions for our wonderful speakers today. Um, again, I would ask that y'all keep, your, uh, keep yourselves muted unless you are a speaker and Brad or Sergeant Johnson, Chief White or Sergeant Johnson, excuse me, please take it away. Okay, uh, do you want me to go first, Brad? I'll go first, I guess, since that's what we, the, the plan was. So thanks everyone for, uh, for letting me uh, participate here. I'm gonna try sharing this. So uh, hopefully this will work for everyone. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, obviously the Cameron Peak we were on for over a hundred days here in Larimer County. And then the, uh, the Thompson zone of uh, the fire that came over, oops, from, uh, from uh, Grand County there that jumped over the, sorry, back up, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the Cameron Peak Fire started August 13th. Um, it was on Forest Service land up by the Cameron Peak area or Chambers Lake area, if you're familiar with our county. Um, over a time, it burned uh, over 200,000 acres, so the largest in the state uh, for that. The 30,000 acres is the approximate Thompson zone uh, slop over that came over the divide. 
uh, for our fire, we lost, you know, 224 residential structures, 220 outbuildings, 17 business. Uh, we did over 20,000 evacuations, and then the suppressing cost was over around $132 million uh, for, for that. Uh, here's the map of the fire. Uh, this was on uh, November 16th, so it didn't really grow after that. But uh, you can see, you know, from Chambers Lake, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, way up here is where the fire started. Uh, you know, and then burned around over those hundred days, getting all the way down. This is Fort Collins, obviously, uh, down in here. And then this part was in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. So a, a, a fair amount of, uh, of the county. Uh, it did run into the High Park uh, burn from 2012 back over in this area, uh, which kind of checked it up. Uh, this area had burned already in, uh, in the High Park area in 2012. So it did... Uh, you know, a large area. I would have never thought, you know, having been here 38 years, that a fire in Chambers Lake would be burning west of Fort Collins. Uh, that was not really in uh, my my thought process, but uh, as we saw, the fire kind of did what it did. Uh, and then, just to kind of give you some perspective, this is the community of Crystal Lakes up here. This is Red Feather Lakes. This area is the Glacier View area, uh, Highway 14, Poudre Canyon, uh, kind of through here. Uh, coming down Masonville, County Road 27. This is uh, the Buckhorn Canyon, kind of goes through right through here. And you'll see some pictures and stuff from some of these other areas. Uh, and then down here, Storm Mountain, this is Highway 34 down in this area. And then Estes Park is right here. And then here's the Thompson uh, slop over uh, down over here by Estes. So uh, I sent Nathan, he had asked for some papers, you know, I don't, we don't really have a paper on how we put out fires, but I sent uh, him some of the suppression, some of the NWCG or National Wildfire Coordinating Group uh, documents that we've used over the years, you know, these fire orders, watch out situations are just kind of standard when you become a, a wildland firefighter. Um, the fire orders, you're not really supposed to violate those. And if you look at fatalities uh, over the years, there's violations there. So watch out, you can mitigate those, um, you know, and, and I'm not gonna go over the individual ones. Like I said, they were in that uh, suppression guide that I, I sent Nathan. The lookouts, communications, escape route safety zones is pretty big now in the, in the fire world. You know, we have establishing those, making sure you have those, whether the fire is a single tree or, you know, such or 200,000 acre, uh, you know, fire. Uh, the strategy, again, overall plan, of the fire and then the tactics are the operational aspects and with these fires well with this fire you know it started on forest service land so obviously they were the lead uh, there was a little bit of private involved and then it burns into the the fire department areas and and brad can also talk about this on the on the troublesome you know and then it exceeds that fire department or these volunteer fire departments they kick it up to the county so then larimer county had it uh, for a number of days. And then once it made some of these big runs, mainly over Labor Day, where it went 80,000 acres, uh, it got kicked up to the state level or Division of Fire Prevention and Con Control. So that's kind of the process. It goes up as it exceeds capabilities and then it comes back down, um, you know, from the other way once we get a, a little bit of a handle on some of these. Uh, you know, the fire size up initial attack. Again, we're trying with these fires to break this fire triangle, which is this, the fuels weather topography. We're, we're trying to take away some of that. So when you see us dig in line, we're trying to remove fuel, um, you know, or cool it with, you know, slurry or retardant or water, you know, and just trying to break one of that. Obviously, we, the weather and the topography are not really breakable unless, I mean, with a bulldozer, you might be able to knock over some trees. But you know, just trying to break that triangle is how we try to get control of these uh, fires. Uh, some of the flame lengths, you know, and once you can use a flame length about four feet, we can get in there with hand tools. Uh, you know, four to eight foot flame lengths, we can do. You know, it's too. We can do a, a a direct attack, and then again, as the flame lengths increase, as you saw with these fires, you know, you're not. You're just made, mainly moving people out of the way. You're totally defensive. You're not uh, not having any operational uh, success with some of this when it really gets up and moves. Um, you know, the different parts of the fire, we try to anchor. We always try to have an anchor where the fire won't come around us and then flank the fire if we can. 
And that's kind of the safest way to do that. Um, and again, like with fire line, you know, you'll see hand line, dozer line, or, or mechanized equipment line. So again, we're just trying to keep the fire in the black from getting into the green or the unburned fuel. So that's kind of some of the tactics, you know, that we're trying to do uh, with these with these fires for that. Um, for this fire, obviously it was a long duration. Uh, we had 10 incident management teams. You know, we provided some local knowledge, a liaison. Uh, the, the problem, or one of the challenges, I shouldn't say a problem, you know, was with all these teams changing every two weeks, 18 days, you have to build up that rapport uh, with a new team coming in. So, you know, that can, it, it takes a little process to do that, a little time to get that get that done. So, uh, you know, that was some of the challenges we had with such a long duration fire. Uh, we also worked obviously with the local fire departments. They're mostly volunteer up in that area. And again, like I talked about delegating the fire to the county. Uh, we did a lot of evacuations with the deputies and fire departments. Uh, and then we took suppression actions where we could. Uh, there were times where we could actually go in there and, and do some suppression action. We worked with our, our law branch or the deputies, and we had many officers from uh, not just the sheriff's office, from cities, the state, uh, local counties or surrounding counties. So again, they were in charge mainly of roadblocks and evacuation areas. You know, we, we answered questions or told them when to pull evacuations, working with the um, incident management teams. Uh, up here in Larimer County, we use, and some other counties may use different terminology. We have voluntary evacuations or mandatory. Uh, those are the two terms we use for that. Um, you know, and again, uh, with the evacuations, with the management teams, there was action points, like if the fire crossed a certain mountain or a certain river, then that would trigger evacuation. So they had on the maps, you know, where these uh, action points were, because you want to give people enough time to evacuate. We don't want panic, you know, mass chaos, cars trying to move around. It just adds to the you know, the chaos that you're already dealing with. So, um, you know, we tried to get a lot of some of these evacuations. Some people admit to me like, well, you're pulling that early or doing those early, but that's just, like I said, to try and get all these people out of the area safely and in a controlled manner uh, as best we can. Uh, we worked with our communication center and I can show you a map later here with some of these evacuation polygons. So these are what you are termed, you know, reverse 911s where these messages go out, we use Everbridge is the system we use. So, and again, then you're going door to door to make sure people, some people, you know, may not got a phone call. So a lot of very intense work on these evacuations, um, you know, and getting them successfully done. And, and thankfully we were able to do that. We didn't have any, you know, fatalities in our county. I know Brad did over there, unfortunately. And then also we assisted obviously with animals, which are a big part when you evacuate. These people you know, will not leave animals, uh, dogs, cats. We had all kinds of alpacas, camels, <laughs> all kinds of uh, animals. We were trying to, to move for these people. So that was, uh, you know, that was a challenge that we had to do with all these, all these days. And then uh, afterwards, you know, we would escort the damage assessment teams in. Because again, the fire was obviously still active, but the sheriff and other um, officials wanted to, you know, know the damage, how many structures were lost or damaged. So we escorted them in since we're fire called and can be on the fire line. Most of them or all of them were not. But as long as we had an escort with them and let the incident management team know, you know, we were able to move in and out uh, with them. Uh, these are just, I'm just going to show you some of the pictures from uh, the different, this is when it kind of started down here. Uh, this is from the Dead Man Lookout Tower. So these are the first days of the fire. And again, we were, we were trying to get some situation awareness on where this fire was going, extreme fire behavior right off the start. It was windy, you know, dry. It's been in the drought up in the, which is rare for those high elevations, you know, 8,000, 9,000 feet. Uh, we usually don't see that here in our county. Um, you know, Williams Fork fire started down in Grand County uh, on the 14th. Uh, you may have seen, we also had, uh, we had the, the military, the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center. We had a couple of Blackhawks uh, looking for supposedly a family in trouble near Blue Lake or, or trapped. Uh, and then we had to go back on the 18th 
and rescue a trapped hiker near Blue Lake. So the uh, AFRCC sent a, a Blackhawk, actually it was the same crew, went up and were able to pull him out. He was the last person that was evacuated from the, from the national forest areas uh, up there without any uh, incident. And then again, we had, uh, you know, that Labor Day weekend was one of the first big pushes of the fire. You know, 78,000 acres plus, mainly on Highway 14. It, it went through the Monument Gulch subdivision, destroyed uh, many properties in here. There's not very many of them left down in there. Went into the Pruder Canyon. And then we had evacuations on the Pingree Park Road and, and some of those other areas. And again, then we were in doing some assessment for the damage teams after that. And then up in Wyoming, we had the Mullen Fire start, which was kind of bordering our Northwest corner. Uh, it never really uh, got into that. So this picture is Chambers Lake right here. You can see all this is burned. You know, this is all the damage up by Chambers Lake where right, you know, where the fire uh, got started up there. As we went through, uh, this is looking from Highway 14 down here, the Sportsman's, if you're familiar with that. So you're looking east. This is kind of behind the Bald Mountains. You know, some of the, some of the fire behavior um, and this is kind of from the other side. So here are the Bald Mountains right here. So, I, you know, just around on the other side from the, this is the Swamp Creek area. So this triggered evacuations in the Red Feather Crystal Lakes Glacier View area. Uh, they were voluntary at first, again, to try to give people that opportunity. And then they did go mandatory as this fire kept coming, you know, with the prevailing west winds, you're looking straight west in this photo. You know, it's gonna come to the, come east there. Uh, this was a pic of a VLAT. So this is a very large air tanker. This is a DC-10. Uh, in all my years of fire, and I know Scott Nutt does a lot of uh, aviation, I didn't think I'd see a VLAT in Larimer County because, again, they're, they're a big aircraft. Um, you know, used to, and they're dropping slurry right there, coming down the Baldies. So uh, again, we're trying to retard the fire in there. So ground crews, there were some ground crews in that area. Some of the hotshot crews were in that area. Um, so he's just trying to lay that down to stop putting out the fire, but he's trying to retard it, uh, to slow it up a little bit. And then the ground crews get in there and uh, work to try and get some line or some containment on the, on the fire there. So, like I said, pretty impressive plane, pretty big. Obviously, like I said, it's a piece of pen. There's also a 747 with this end version of this coming over. Sorry. Uh, this was on the 25th of September. So the fire jumped the Highway 14 near the fish hatchery um, and, and burned, did some damage down there, burning structures. And this was just some of the fire behavior uh, that we saw. There was a lot of power lines down along this road, you know, with the um, with just the line, the poles getting cut. Uh, this was up by Arrowhead Lodge. Uh, we were doing some burnout operations. So again, just trying to burn out uh, the fuel between the structures down at that lodge and the, the fire, uh, the lodge would be kind of back on this side. So just some of the um, that we were seeing and then some of this was, you know, we were putting some fire down. So this, this here is more of a burnout in the video. All this on the Uh, some other fire, you know, again, these are kind of moving in days. So the next day, the fire moved down through Bel Air Lake, the seven mile drainage. Um, it got into uh, Goodell Corners, the Shambhala Center, which lost the 17 business structures. We're in that Shambhala Center, uh, kind of down on the Boy Scout Road there. We were trying to, you know, do some uh, structure protection. And then on the, on the 27th, we get into that Shambhala Center. If you're familiar with that, there was this Grand Stupa, which is a, the Shambhala Center is a Buddhist uh, kind of camp. And uh, the Shambhala Center is a big uh, kind of gold uh, temple. I don't know if that's the correct word for Buddhists, uh, a worship place. But the, that, that uh, Shambhala or that uh, Stupa did not burn uh, during the fire. Most of the buildings around it did burn. 
In fact, I think all of them did, but the stupa itself, we had, there was crews in there trying to do some structure protection and, uh, and keep that from. Hey, Kevin, um, just, just real quick, we have a request in chat. I'm guessing you have more videos. If you are playing more videos, if you can mute the videos, because some people are having a harder time hearing you over the video. Oh, oh, okay. Although I'm enjoying it because it adds to the effect, but yeah. Okay, my, my bad. No, yeah, no, I'll show, no, Okay, I'll show you some, uh, I'll, I'll show the video and then I'll talk, I guess, would be the easiest. Uh, so this was on in October of uh, the 5th and 7th. So again, this is down Highway 14, kind of up at the north end uh, or the west end, I'm sorry, of Highway 14 by some of the, the buildings there. And, and basically you had like in this video, which I'll show a running crown fire on Highway 14, which again, totally wouldn't expect is super dry, super windy. Uh, these two are the you know, ones, this one was first and then we backed up a little bit uh, to this one. So this is this is this fire as it got really going uh, there. And then this one over here is a video of a helicopter doing some water drops uh, a couple of days later in the same area, a little bit to the east. We were trying to protect those. So uh, I'll stop talking. And Again, this these are in this is in a river bottom right here on the flat. So you can see extreme kind of fire behavior that we're normally not seeing in the river. Yeah, so again, you know, this was down in uh, Scott Nutt, I know was working a lot of helicopters. He might've been managing that uh, sky crane that came in that day. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Uh, this was uh, a couple of days later in the Sky Lutheran Ranch, which is up by the CSU campus up there off the Pingree Park Road. Um, so again, this was on the 9th. These two are on the 9th. This one is on the, these are on the 10th over here. So we were in there doing some structure protection. The team had laid out some hose lays and we were working with those to, to just try and uh, keep some of that from, from burning up. And you can see flame lengths, obviously several hundred feet in the air, you know, that running crown fire uh, back in there kind of coming around Hourglass Reservoir. And again, there is back there. And then the night, uh, we were able to do some burnout around some of the structure. This was an amphitheater that we were trying to protect. So uh, we were burning out uh, in the willows. This is in a willow bottom. Uh, you see again, extreme. This is usually wetter than it normally is. So you can't get fire to go through there that quick. but. Just so dry, so it's such rare conditions or so extreme conditions, you know, that uh, we were able to burn out some. Of and then uh, this is on the 10th. Again, we're just a little bit to the north of the CSU campus uh, in there.
and then the fire, uh, I, you know, kind of burned around a little bit. And then on the 14th, uh, I made a major run down County Road 44H or the Buckhorn Canyon. Um, destroyed pretty much the whole Crystal Mountain subdivision. I think there's about eight homes left up there. And then this was down on the 14th. We were down at Bobcat Ridge Natural Area. So just... You know, that's the Division of Fire Prevention and Control module. We were actually on the other side of that meadow, but you, again, just wanted to show you kind of the extreme wind, uh, what we were dealing with. This is that same pick, that same day. Uh, this is from my sister-in-law's house in, in Loveland. So, and then that night. So again, just some of that extreme uh, behavior that we were seeing there. Sorry, I'm not an expert with the screen saving yet. Uh, and then this was up when the troublesome fire exploded, as Brad will go into, you know, jumped the Continental Divide, which again, that we were thinking that was going to hold it on that side, the west side of the park, but it jumped over. Uh, the Estes Valley was excavated, evacuated. So this was some of the and you can imagine the traffic and it went pretty smooth, took about six hours or so to get all the people out of the Estes Valley that wanted to evacuate. Um, so again, just a logistical uh, kind of heart headache, but uh, you know, all the agencies did a great job of getting uh, those people out. And then, um, you know, the next uh, days, you know, this was in the park, this is Moraine Park, this video is in Moraine Park. Of Rocky Mountain National Park, the same uh, park where the Fern Lake Fire came out in 2012. And again, just some photos of uh, you know that wind, some of that extreme behavior, and then again, just some of the some of the techniques we use. Here we are burning out. You can see there's a hose lay here. There's a line here. We're just trying to burn some fuel around these uh, properties that are in there. There's some private inholdings uh, in the inside the park uh, that are. Uh, I don't know the date from, you know, before. I don't know if they were there when the park was created. Uh, some evacuations. Again, we had zero lives lost, which was a, a, you know, a credit to all the responders and all the citizens who helped us evacuate. Um, you know, 276 emergency alerts went out over the course of this fire. Uh, five of these iPods, which is a FEMA uh, system, it'll basically hit any phone. It's not carrier specific. So you don't have to have Verizon or you know sign up for an alert. It'll basically find any phone in the area that the the polygon is drawn and send that message out. Uh, Lita is the phone authority that kind of oversees the the Everbridge system and, and handles a lot of the um, the evacuation work. I mean the dispatch centers obviously do that, and that's how many citizens were evacuated. And again, some of these people had to evacuate numerous times as this fire kind of ebbed and flowed uh, back and forth. And this is just a map of the, of the polygon. So here's the fire. This is the Cameron Peak fire right here. Um, and then these were all the polygons that were drawn. It gets a little confusing in here, but you, know, you can see we had to build those and, and send those out. And then these are just some of, this is the troublesome fire. This is the Mullen fire kind of up here. Uh, and then this is Cowwood down in Boulder County that started. So that's all I got. So I know uh, questions are later. Yep, um, we will just move right along into Brad's presentation. Chief White, if you will take us away. Yeah, let me see if I can get my screen shared here. Okay, so uh, a lot of similar experiences to the Sergeant. Um, and some different too. So uh, this will be good. Um, we'll get some duplicate stuff. So we'll be able to kind of move through some of this a little faster, I think. But, uh, you know, again, thanks for having me. You know, Nathan asked for us, for me to speak out on uh, operations on these troublesome fire. And I kind of warned him that I don't know that we were the poster children of the best way to do operations, uh, but it ended up working out for us pretty well. So um, I'll tell you about our experience and then, then we'll see what questions folks have. So um, real quick, you know, um, 
the sergeant touched on a lot of this, but uh, we sent out some homework. The, um, the national system for fighting wildland fire is, is kind of interesting. It, it doesn't have a lot of mandatory rules and, and uh, statute and things like that behind it like you think it would, but it's uh, based on the National Wildfire Coordination Group and putting forward, you know, working together to come up with best policy, best procedure. And um, so I'll take a quick second. I want to talk just a, a little bit on, on how, um, how the national system kind of works. And then uh, we'll kind of move into the conditions here in Grand County and, and move forward from there. So I get this next slide, it's, it's kind of dizzying, so bear with me. Um, but this is kind of my representation, if you will, on, on our national wildfire um, system. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we got approximately, you know, on, on our really busy summers, we've got about 20,000 firefighters nationally, maybe a few more assigned to the big fires around. And uh, unlike, you know, I run a fire department and we've got kind of a central station with a lot of equipment here and, you know, we send it out. On, on this national wildfire system, we have units based all over the country and probably more so here in the West, but, um, you know, there might be a single engine based out of a forest service office and there might be a single uh, hotshot crew based out of a BLM office, things like that. And so when there's a local fire, uh, you know, we start with nearest resources and we pile them onto what we call an initial attack fire. And then as we've got more and more needs, you know, we start bringing them in from the region. And so what we saw this summer here in, in Colorado and other parts of the West was, you know, a lot of large fires that took um, some larger incident management teams and a lot of resources in the area. So, um, this, this is out of that reading I sent for you guys. You know, this is the basic command structure for a large type one incident or a type two incident maybe. Um, and you can see the left-hand side is the operations section. You've got a lot of, uh, you know, you, when you think about fighting fire, you think about the operations and the things that's happening out there, the aircraft and the firefighters scraping line and all that. But you can see on the right-hand side, there's a lot of support that goes with that. But the main point I wanna make is it's all very scalable. And so when we do an initial attack, like the fire districts do most often, you know, we might only use a few positions. We might have the incident command, we might have a couple engines and uh, pretty quick, seems like we need a PIO to keep uh, the locals happy and informed. And um, so it's, you know, it starts as a small organization and then it scales up as we need it, so. Um, here's an example, uh, you know, type five incidents, relatively small incident. Um, like I said, we do do initial attack, could be just an engine, could be a couple engines, a couple firefighters. So in the foreground here, you've got a, a type five incident we ran on October, uh, sorry, August 15th, the day after the Williams, P, Williams Fork fire started, which is that fire in the background. And at that point in time, they had a type two team ordered uh, with a type three team managing it. Um, so I go through all this mostly because, uh, you know, as we get late into the season here and are dealing with things, you know, we're, we're fighting for incident management teams with all the other fires and we're scaling up, scaling down, uh, depending on needs, you know, every few days it felt like. So, um, so here's, here's kind of the situation in Grand County, you know, the day before our East Troublesome started. That's a picture, that's a uh, pictometry picture the county happened to take of the top of the Kinney Creek drainage where uh, our blow up started on the 21st. And you can see the, the beetle kill situation there. You know, we had this in the mid 2000s, um, it's pine beetle, excuse me, pine beetle epidemic come through the county and had about an 80% mortality. And we started with, uh, you know, the trees died and we had the dead and red phase for a few years. And then uh, all the needles dropped. And, and now we're in this part, point where trees are just dropping, you know, daily in this area. And so you can kind of see the, the expanse of, of what was what was killed through the beetle infestation there 15 years ago almost. So then we get into this summer, um, you know, just hot dry conditions, the fuel moistures are really low for the whole summer, really the whole year. Uh, but as uh, Kevin mentioned on a bunch of these, you know, pine gold star fire starts over in Grand Junction the end of July, and then they just start ticking off. You know, we get Grizzly Peak fire starts uh, August 10th, Williams Fork here in Grand County on August 14th, Cameron Peak just after that, uh, our Middle Fork fire um, over near Steamboat 96, uh, the Mullen fire up in Wyoming. East Troublesome starts near Kremlin on the 14th of October. 
And uh, then you get those couple of fires over in, in Boulder, Cowhead, Left Hand Canyon. So, you know, the main point here is the resources were thin. You know, the federal system was, was pretty thin and we're late in the season uh, into the seasonal drawdowns and they've lost a lot of their seasonal help and uh, people are back to school and back to other jobs and things like that. So, um, so that first week of these troublesome, again, started near Kremlin. I think it popped about 3,400 acres the first day, uh, primarily on the Route National Forest and Bureau land management lands. And uh, we had a uh, Type 2 incident management team from the Northern Rockies out of Montana here managing the Williams Fork fire. And uh, the second day of these troublesome, they, they accept management of this fire, so they're now managing two fires. They are also, uh, I think about day 13, 14 when they took this and typically the incident management teams, you know, they do two weeks and then they're out and the next team comes in. Kevin kind of talked about that. So, uh, you know, the whole week uncharacteristically heavy winds. Uh, each day we added somewhere between 500 and up to 4,000 acres each day. Uh, we'd done a number of pre-evacuations near Highway 40. I'll, I got a map here for you next, but. Uh, and, and quite a few evacuations already. So felt like we were ahead of the game on most of that. Um, Kevin alluded to this too, uh, delegations. So as a fire district, as a fire chief here in Colorado, uh, I'm responsible for initial attack in my district. And at some point when we have large fire, it, it gets beyond our control, you know, both with resources as well as financially. And so at that point we delegate up to the sheriff if he's willing to accept it. And then he turns around and tries to delegate it off to uh, Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control and have them take ownership of it and, and thus the price tag too. Um, and all that happened on the 17th before it even hit private ground. We knew this fire was gonna be moving at some point and uh, we got our paperwork done early. So, so from my standpoint, um, you know, we're now part of the system and, and uh, the sheriff and the DFPC are working with um, as agency administrators working with the incident management team there and, and the local guys are off the hook and we're free to go run traffic accidents and fire alarms and that sort of thing in theory. So um, here, here's a map. So you'll see Granby's on the bottom right. That's where my office is here. And you'll see Highway 40 comes up, takes a left, heads west and runs through the town of Hot Sulphur Springs and Partial and then Kremlin's just out of the map there. Uh, just north of Granby, Highway 34 heads up past Lake Granby and to uh, the town of Grand Lake. And then from there through Rocky Mountain National Park and over into Estes and, and Kevin's territory over there and Chief Wolf. And then you'll see in the middle here, Highway 125, and that heads north out of Granby up to uh, North Park into Walden. And uh, so this perimeter was taken on the 20th in the evening. It was the, the nighttime flight. And I think we were about 18,000 acres at that point. And uh, we had management action points at the fire hit here. We were gonna talk about evac in this area and that area. And at this point, we had most of the homes uh, along Highway 40, with the exception of the town of Hot Sulphur Springs and Partial. Most of those were under pre-evac pre at that point or already evacuated. And Highway 125 had already been evacuated past, uh, I think mile marker four, if I remember right. So that lower part still had some folks there, but a lot of the livestock and all that was already pulled out. So we've been watching this, you can see on the perimeter of the fire here, this flank comes off and uh, it comes down a drainage called Cabin Creek. And we've been watching that for, for a number of days and it's kind of been slowly working its way down there. And, and we knew at some point it was gonna cross and then it'll be going uphill on the other side and have slope and wind alignment and a different, you know, more southwesterly exposure. And we, and we knew the fire behavior would pick up over there. Um, so I think uh, about 2, 3 o'clock the afternoon of the 21st. Oh, well, the other thing going on on the 21st is uh, it's transition day. That type two team had been shopping for a new incident management team. They found type one team out of Pacific Northwest. And so this was a uh, shadow day. So the, um, the type two team technically owns this fire until 6 a.m. and the type one team is there Kind of getting acquainted and seeing what's going on and checking out the fuel conditions and the topography and all that. And I get a call uh, again about 2.30 or so and they said, hey, it looks like the fires crossed Highway 125. Why don't you come up, take a look, let's introduce you to the new guys, talk about some things. We had a pretty good discussion and the, the type one team, the moral of their story was, 
hey, we ordered a bunch of resources before we even left the Northwest, but uh, things are tight and we're not getting much. You know, what, what do you guys have available? So we talked about, uh, we've got five fire districts here locally, talked about what was available locally. Uh, we're also part of a 10 county, what we call the Mountain Aid, Mountain Area Mutual Aid System. And um, this is a, a group that kind of got together after the 2017 season that was pretty rough and, and just decided, you know, it's a shortcut to get some, some firefighting resources in route. You know, it's, it's not ordering through the federal system. It's not ordering through local dispatch centers, but it's at least getting some folks in route. And, and the idea is, you know, 24 hours of mutual aid while you're waiting for correctly ordered resources to, to get here. And uh, so we talked about all those options. And, and honestly, we're talking about, um, you know, this fire being over on Highway 34, probably the next afternoon or the next afternoon. I uh, was working with the undersheriff a little bit on evacuations. We talked about giving, uh, giving folks on Highway 34 a nice leisure morning to get out of there in the morning. You know, we do probably about nine o'clock in the morning issue a evac order for a couple of subdivisions. So, you know, at this point in the game, we still feel like things are, are progressing. You know, we know they're, they're, we got a few days of fire before we get into snow, but we're still feeling pretty good about things. Uh, the state has a multi-mission aircraft uh, that takes thermal imaging pictures uh, as well as color and all that. So uh, we were fortunate they were flying and I'm gonna click this. You'll see it kind of, you'll see the perimeters. I just overlaid them here so they'll be in blue. But um, so this is kind of what we saw from about 4.30 on to six o'clock. So you saw that middle finger there at the Cabin Creek grew quite a bit, then that north side poofed out. And then finally there you see how the south side looks and it's getting ready to push. And so I changed the slide. Here's the last image it took, the last perimeter it took. And this was about 6.20 in the evening. So right now the uh, sheriff is over at the incident command post giving his nightly briefing, telling everybody life's not bad. We got things under control. And meanwhile, this is what's happening out in the field. <laughs> so, um, so this photo I took about 620. Um, you can see this is uh, from up Highway 34 looking back towards um, Highway 125. And the fire finally kind of crested, picked up speed. I actually didn't catch it. I took this photo on the fly and I actually didn't catch it till I got it back to my computer that that bottom right, you can see the fire you know, ultimately it's on the, on the east side of Highway 125 there. So, so it's, it's about this time that we uh, start getting our act together and um, law enforcement starts working some evacs. Uh, we start calling local fire resources up into subdivision we call Trail Creek up County Road 41. So it's, it's near the lake on that last slide there. Um, and things really move. So here's, here's the midnight perimeter. And you can see the dark sh shadow there is the 620 perimeter. And then um, we, we added another 80,000 acres or something between there and there. So uh, you can see these fingers, um, some discussion for some time on what kind of blew through town here. But, but here's my take, you know, you look at these arrows and that's kind of the general direction things were, were moving with the southwesterly winds there. And so that Southern finger, that Southern flank is really kind of what went through all our subdivisions. And uh, between about, uh, well, really about 5 p.m. to about 8 p.m., uh, we ran that whole southern side there. And it represents about 24 miles of fire front uh, and about 36 subdivisions this fire ran through in just a short amount of time. So there's a shot taken from town about, uh, I think this one was uh, pretty close to 6.30. Pretty exciting. And then uh, this one we just got a hold of this week, so I threw it in there. So here's a time lapse. And this is about five minutes compressed into about 20 seconds here. So you can see the fire, uh, that left side is about that Kinney Creek area and it just starts in the winds. The winds did not die down, they picked up at 6 p.m. and just pushed this fire. And you can see behind that tree on the right is uh, we're getting up into what an area we call Gold Run, just getting pretty close to that Trail Creek subdivision. Oh, there we go. So here's the next picture I took. 
uh, and this was up County Road 4, which is a little further north on the lake. Um, EVAC's in full progress at this point. We'd sent all our firefighting resources up to the Trail Creek area, as we call it. Um, they got there and they were actually boxed out of there. They couldn't even get in. So they joined law enforcement, saw how fast this fire was moving and joined in the evacuation process. And just kind of, they were leading out in front of this fire, just trying to get folks out of the subdivisions. And uh, I had stayed in town an extra couple of minutes, got some more resources coming. And I was kind of following back behind the evac group, just trying to figure out where this fire was, was and what it was doing. So you can see the house on the left and you can see that hill off in the distance on the right. And you see the, you know, there's some shadows there on the, or some, uh, those are trees on the top of the hill. And those are, those are good 40 foot trees. So we've got some pretty good flame links going on at this point. So what's a guy to do at this point, right? Um, so we'd still been chatting with the incident management team, but as we got into DART, you know, most of that type two team, I think had flights out of the area at eight, nine in the morning, and they were trying to get things coordinated with the incoming team who took over at six. And honestly, we didn't see a lot of them that night, um, but we pulled together local groups. Uh, so we had the five fire districts here, as well as our mountain area group. Um, and we're by midnight, we're able to get pretty close to 30 engines, about 96 firefighters. and uh, was trying to get a tally on law enforcement. Um, we had about 40 local law enforcement, but uh, our regional firefighter, sorry, regional partners there, we had another 15 engine, another 42 firefighters. And you can see all the agencies there that uh, were kind enough to come over last minute and help out. And um, the sheriff was able to pull in about another 80 law enforcement folks from our, our neighboring agencies. Um, we also worked with DFPC, tried something kind of new. Um, they did it once over on Kevin's fire at the Cameron, but uh, they put an all call out to the state looking for what we call surge, a surge, you know, surge resources. And I think ultimately they were able to get about another 18 engines out of the, not just our state, but a couple out of Kansas as well. So I know we're going to be running a little tight on time here, but I'll run through uh, kind of how the next couple of days went and then, then we'll open it up. So these red markers are the, uh, the local resources. And pretty much after the evacuation, we kind of stopped at a tactical pause. We got everybody accounted for, got a bunch of water down them. And uh, pretty quick, we prioritized the town of Grand Lake as an economic center and, and something that really needed to be there in the morning. So we, we pretty much sent all our local resources back up uh, to the town of Grand Lake. And they spent a couple hours working. Anybody familiar with that area, the, you know, there was fire around the Grand Lake Lodge. In fact, there were reports early on that the lodge was gone. Um, and there was fire up in the National Park around Kawanichi Visitor Center. And it was just trying to creep back into town. So we got resources on that and uh, kept moving. So that's about 2100, about nine o'clock. Uh, next slide here, about midnight. Um, these purple ones that show up, those are our mountain area partners. So, so mutual aid that's kind of inbound. Uh, green down at the bottom here, the incident management team did have, um, I forget exactly, I think it was a shot crew and about four engines up there doing some back burning, just trying to get some containment on one edge of the fire here, since they lost it all, all the containment on that side the, earlier in the afternoon. A little C at the bottom is our command post. Uh, but long story short, we got things situated pretty good in the town of Grand Lake, and then we bumped a lot of our local resources across the highway uh, into the subdivisions there, Columbine Lake. Uh, Sun Valley Estates, you know, a couple of county roads there. And then our mountain area partners, as they came in, uh, we pushed them back up into the Trail Creek area and County Road 4 and 41, 42, that area. Just, just doing what we can do at that point to um, minimize the loss. So this was taken by one of my captains. This is a good indication of really what we asked firefighters to work in for days. Um, just pretty much was uh, no matter where you went, it was just fire all around you. On the left, you'll see there's a house in the foreground already gone. There's one in the back going off now. Um, the picture on the right there is just an example. You know, there was, I'm gonna say easily a dozen and a half homes or so that were saved that were on fire. And because firefighters dug into them a little bit, uh, in some cases, you know, dug into the, to the actual structure. In other cases, they are pulling um, pulling decks and things off the house that are on fire to keep the house in good shape. I got a quick video here in the middle. I'll just kind of show you the, the conditions. 
That's a house in the background going off. So, uh, you know, that was, again, largely the conditions for a couple of days. You know, as we got one area kind of buttoned up, we'd move into another area that, that still had fire going on. Most of those um, really active spots in the foreground there you see are um, natural gas and propane in the, the homes that are gone. And so it was uh, kind of interesting, you know, you pull into a subdivision and you could tell where houses used to be because you'd have these big propane flares going off uh, at those homes and then you'd go concentrate on where the fire wasn't yet. So next day, uh, the incident management team sends some crews back out, join us. Um, quite a bit of work on that south side, just trying to get containment. Uh, we, we end up having a second wind event on Thursday and the wind lines up a little different. It's coming straight out of the west. So that lower part down by the lake is, is really where a lot of the activity was on, uh, on Thursday the 22nd. Um, pretty, pretty sizable firefighting force out here now, I think, between the team and, and what the local groups brought in. You know, we're up into the, you know, 380, 400 firefighters working away now. And I think they, uh, they pulled some, some folks off of Kevin's fire over there and some out of the Boulder fires and stuff like that. So just trying to get some more resources into the area. Here's a picture Thursday afternoon. Uh, it's the town of Granby in the front. And uh, you can see the fire. You know, these aren't heavily forested hills on this side. The north, north side's got some forest, south side's all sage. Um, but that's actually a pretty nice subdivision going off up there. There's a number of, um, shoot, eight, 10,000 square foot homes that are, you know, in the multi-million dollars each. So those dark spots are actually some of those homes torching off. You can see there's a, an evac going off through town there. They're heading south towards Fraser. Uh, we didn't actually, we, we evacuated a couple of the subdivisions around the town of Granby, and we're having a lot of discussion on when to pull the trigger for the town of Granby. We never actually pulled that trigger because the winds actually died down, but there was a lot of uh, um, voluntary evacuation going on at that point. A lot of the folks that we evacuated out of Grand Lake down to Granby were now on the move again. So here's Thursday afternoon, um, just some different, uh, you know, that top right is, is probably really about noon as the, the second fire front starts picking up. Again, another windy, windy afternoon. And uh, the picture top left, bottom right are um, just pictures throughout the afternoon. You know, the folks down there working on fire. Uh, lost another batch of homes. Um, it, you know, Thursday, at least we felt like we had a fighting chance. We had some folks in those areas and uh, doing a lot of structure protection and put some fire on the ground around homes, uh, clearing decks, things like that. Uh, but we did get to a point, this, um, this isn't far from the Highland Marina area that ended up crossing Highway 34 and uh, took, out, took out the marina and took out quite a few trailer homes, things like that. Um, so plenty of activity still going on. Go into the Thursday night, um, you know, again, we start losing some of our mountain area group. Uh, they got to head home. Um, we start trying to get some of our firefighters some rest. We've, we've had some folks out since Wednesday morning. And so some of them are getting up into that 40 hours. Uh, we, we tried with our local guys to do a lot of crew swaps. We had some engines that were just out for three days straight, but they'd come in every 12 hours, get a new crew, head back out. And uh, that worked pretty well. Um, and then uh, the incident management team put together a, a night division and they said they'd take Highway 40, Highway 125, and we kind of kept working our crews up, up Highway 34 here. You'll see up uh, by the Grand Lake, there's another batch of the incident management team crew. They uh, put a couple of shot crews up in the town of Grand Lake and did a back burn uh, up, up into the Tanahutu Valley there to keep that fire from, from creeping back down into town on the backside there. So they managed that for a couple of days. Um, 23rd, same thing, more activity. Uh, that south side, they're able to get a lot of containment, a lot of heavy equipment, dozers pushing stuff, uh, burning some things out. And it's just plugging away, just still working around those homes and saving what we could. I think um, the last set of homes I know that burned were probably midday Friday. So we lost um, 566 structures, 366 homes. And I, I would be willing to bet we lost, you know, 320 of those homes on uh, the first two hours on Wednesday during the blow up. 
And then we lost another batch Thursday afternoon and just a couple on Friday. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the um, org chart here a little bit. You know, this, this is the type of organization that should be built here. And uh, by all rights, you know, as, as wildland firefighters, our local guys should have been plugged in working for the incident management team and for a variety of reasons, it, it, it didn't really happen. So we ended up kind of creating this separate branch that, you know, I, I feel like we had good communications. You know, I was talking real regular with their uh, structure protection division as well as their ops chief. And, um, but sort of operated as, as two separate groups which, you know, in this particular case, I, I feel like ended up working out well for us. I think I would have had a hard time on home turf pulling that many firefighters off and send them to bed at, at eight o'clock uh, while stuff was burning. They just weren't going to do it unless somebody was able to take their place. Um, but definitely created some, some tactical challenges and some communication issues. So, so again, I, I say we're not the poster child of the best way to do it, but I think what we did worked out well, worked out right. Um, and would I do it again? I, I think on home turf, I, I, like, like I said, it worked. So here's, uh, here's final perimeter. Um, what we didn't talk about is what Kevin talked about this fire. Uh, the 21st actually jumped the divide. They had a spot on the 22nd over in Rocky Mountain National Park on the east side of the divide. And they, um, I think that day wasn't too bad for them, but the next few days, uh, Chief Wolf and uh, Montgomery County were over there working hard on that end. So morning of the 21st, we're at 18,550 acres. The night of the 22nd, we're 186,000 acres, uh, almost 187,000 acres. So in a quick 36 hours, um, that, that's, that's a sizable fire. And to this day, uh, I think there's a lot of us locals that when we finally got a breath and started driving around, not looking for fire, but, but just seeing what we got, decided this was a pretty big fire. So the, the final acreage on this thing, um, I think they called it contained on December 1st, 2nd, somewhere in there, 194,000 acres. And then uh, on the 25th, we get snow. <laughs> and that's Captain Becker on the left, and he is he approves of the new current conditions on the fire ground. Uh, but I threw this picture in on the right. Uh, we spent the next several weeks, as did the incident management team, um, just handling 911 calls that were smoke reports. And uh, we had a number of willow and aspen patches where the roots were on fire, and they would work their way up close, get some air, poof up a little bit. And they were well into the black. They weren't any problem. But uh, the public's pretty sensitive at this point. So we just spent some time tending to those needs and spending some time with the public. And, but that, that went on in, in some chip piles. We've still got some chip piles probably that are, that are hot and on fire. So, so that was kind of our operational experience out there. And um, I'll turn it back to you guys and see if we've got questions or if I... Yeah, I'll turn that over to Gloria. Thank you both for um, amazing presentations. I'm sure that um, a lot of people are going to use this recording for um, as a good reference for operations perspective on both of these fires. Uh, we are over time, a few minutes. Um, we have the Zoom appointment reserved till about 4.15. So I'll toss uh, just a few questions out. Uh, there were lots of operational questions and thank you Rocco and Peter Anderson and a lot of the ops people attending for taking on um, a lot of those answers that I'm not in a position to, to answer. Um, but I have a, a couple of general groups of questions and I'll hop into one of the biggest ones first. Um, and this I guess would mostly be for Kevin there were some fuels uh, reduction projects across the um, uh, Poudre River watershed uh, before the fire that summer or, or previous, in some previous seasons. Did you notice any benefits? And I mean, we're talking about massive fuel loads and fuel debt plus extreme weather conditions. Did you notice any benefits from the fuels reduction projects or any effect on the fire behavior? You know, and I didn't obviously, you know, see maybe where some of those were. I know um, 
you know, just with the extreme conditions, the, these fires were just moving through pretty much anything. And, uh, you know, I know if a lot were done on the national forest land, I don't, I can't speak to those where those actual projects were. I know up in the Moraine Park of, of Rocky, you know, the park had done a lot of uh, fuels mitigation around some of those inholdings and the fire did come out of the tree and get on the ground, which is where we want it to be to attack it. Uh, in the Crown Fire, we can't do much other than fall back. So I did see some up in the, in the park for some of their fuels treatments, uh, as far as the the Poudre watershed and some of the other ones, uh, I I can't really say. Like I said, extreme fire behavior was just kind of blowing through, uh, you know, spotting out ahead of itself a mile, sometimes more ahead of itself. So uh, you know, I don't know if those fuel reductions would would hold with that those extreme wind and and dry conditions. Yeah, this is. I mean, we're talking about for. To make enough difference, I think in these extreme conditions, we'd we'd have to have fuel conditions probably from a hundred years ago, <laughs> probably to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, you're talking wind too. You know, winds were 40, 50, gusting up to 70 miles an hour. You know, at times, so just you know, just crazy weather. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna jump to another topic here, um, and this may be something for Cine or um, if there's an entomologist or fire ecologist out there that would like to hop on and answer this. Um, did you see any effect? Uh, science has technically shown that there isn't that much effect from be the standing beetle kill or standing dead from beetle kill because by the time it's in gray phase, all the leaves are off, needles are off and you have live green trees that are just as or more flammable. Um, did you see, either one of you see any behave, fire behavior related to standing beetle kill you want to address? So, so I'll maybe take a crack at that. Um, so, so what we saw, we, we definitely know we have a fuels problem and been working with our federal pro partners on some projects and things. But uh, yeah, it, it's exactly that. Not only do we have this heavy, heavy dead fuel that is super dry in the forest, but uh, we've already got this this regen, you know, both um, you know pine trees as well as you know different shrubs and grass that uh, you know we've seen some areas now that used to be good thick lodgepole forest that now have you know in a good wet year will have three and four foot tall grass in it, and so and so we almost have this stacked fuel model that um, is is really difficult to do anything with. It just makes the fire extremely hot and extremely fast. Did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'm assuming so. We could spend, like uh, Nate said, we could spend another class on just that topic. Um, yeah, but you, you're not just dealing with the standing dead, you're dealing with the fuel loading on the ground plus the fuels that grow up afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another general group of questions, and this is probably going to be the uh, last one we have time for um, changes you'd like to see in evacuation systems. Um, and or an available equipment. And if you'd like to address um, how you handle people who want to stay. Well, you're the one who can talk about that because you did have to go through that on the East Troublesome. Yeah, so on, on East Troublesome, um, you know, we were fortunate, I should I use that loosely, but uh, with our Williams Fork fire in the south part of the, the uh, county started you know, two months earlier, we actually went through and we, we were probably a little behind the game on uh, building some evac zones and things like that. But we, we got it done during the William Schwartz fire. And then when we started these troublesome, we were able to adapt some things and some good policy and, uh, you know, good process. Um, so I feel like the first week, um, we had a really controlled process and everything worked pretty well. Uh, we got into the big blow up that was kind of very last minute. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time in this county telling people, you know, register for code red. And that's just a constant process. We constantly have new people in, a lot of tourists and, uh, you know, our, our locals change out every few years. And, and you got to just keep reminding them they got to register if they're going to get the notification. Uh, one thing we discussed in our after action, we, we got an iPause notification that we just gained access to, I want to say about a year ago. And that just beams everybody off the cell tower. And I don't have a good answer. I don't think we used it. I don't know why we didn't use it other than everybody was busy. 
Um, but as far as uh, folks that didn't want to leave, so, so we did it, we had two fatalities and they were contacted multiple times by law enforcement, uh, locals, their kids were calling them from across the country. Uh, you know, they, they were notified many times and they, they decided they were going to stay and, and, you know, that, that's certainly a loss and it's unfortunate, but they, they certainly had their chance. Uh, we did have a number of other folks that felt like they were going to stay. And I, I can tell you, it was a tough decision on our law enforcement to decide they're going to leave these people and move on down the street to the next batch of folks. And I, I, uh, I know from kicking around our little command post that next morning, there was, there was a lot of concern over that. And we were fortunate. We felt, um, you know, everybody somehow got notified. And even those, most of those that said they were going to stay actually ended up bugging out at some point. We went back and checked homes the next morning and, and a lot of those folks had turned out, decided they were leaving. Um, we've learned from a few fires that you can, you can cry chicken too early and push people out. And then if you let them back in, you're never going to get them out again. And so it's always a timing thing. And so a lot of discussion. And would it have been nice to give them another four hours? Absolutely. Um, but I think if we'd given them 24 hours, uh, we probably would have lost a lot more people because they would have been there feeling like the conditions were just slowly moving just like they were. So I, I think the, I think in our case, the urgency probably lended to some success just because they could look out their door and see the embers flying through the subdivision and, oh, oh, you guys are serious. Well, your work up there was nothing short of miraculous and the evacuation of Estes Park as well as no loss of life, life up the Poudre Canyon is truly commendable. And I, I join the general public in thanking you for all your service and for your time today. Um, there are lots of other questions. The chat uh, entries are recorded to uh, our account. And for those of you who would really like some of these questions answered, we can share the chat record with the speakers and um, perhaps get back to you through your email, your registration email. Yep. Um, and I think the poll is still running. We are all grant funded programs and your feedback are essential to the maintenance of our projects and our improvement and our programming. So please answer the poll, it's very important to us. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, Cindy or Nate or Ty, do you have any other comments before we wind up? Many thanks for your contribution today. This is great and for your, your great work. Thank you. Yeah, huge thank you. That was really great perspective. Thanks. Yeah, and Gloria, like I said, yeah, you guys and Nate have you have my email. If anyone has any questions, they can they can email me and I'll I'll answer them. It's not an issue or not a problem. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, keep this in mind for any other outreach or information that you'd like to share about these fires, because uh, we know that the effects are going to continue for decades, and we may not be finished with this yet. There's, there's plenty more up there. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to share in terms of um, people changing their awareness or, or um, wildfire response behavior? What works? Well, I mean, I think it's a good system. You know, there's always, you can make changes, but again, just such the extreme, numerous large fires like Brad pointed out and, and the extreme conditions, it was very taxing for the, the agencies. And we weren't the only state burning, obviously the Northwest was burning, you know, California was burning. So again, it does tax the system. Uh, and we just kind of fell into the, the, the barrel of the gun or whatever, you know, this time to, to just draw these fires and some of them later in the season than we normally see. I mean, so that was kind of a big challenge, but I think overall the cooperation with all the partners and all the, the local agencies that at least we have in Lamar County, I'm sure Grand County has it, you know, is a benefit to the citizens, you know, not just in our areas, but we can support, you know, some of the areas around us or in the country. Absolutely. And I, I'd probably add, I think one of the biggest, our biggest takeaways here in Grand County, um, you know, we, we've not traditionally had a lot of big fire in Grand County. We're, we're fairly high altitude. Um, but in the last, I think, four or five years, you know, we've had, uh, I think we're up to about four fires that, that had not just incident management team in on it, but rotating incident management teams. 
And um, we, through the course of the summer, felt like each team that came in, there was a little loss in translation. And, um, you know, we kind of had to get th through that, reestablish who all the players were and, and what was important to Grand County. And I think, you know, one of the things I, I think, you know, especially if you've got any future uh, firefighters that will end up in incident management, I, I think as a nation, as a, as a country, we have to, um, you know, I, we need more people, right? That's the biggest thing. But I, I think we need to look at not doubling the number of incident management teams, but let's double the capacity within the existing incident management teams. And maybe when we get a large fire, that team takes it and they're going to take it for the duration. They're just going to rotate their own folks in and out so that they've got good, consistent information flow and things like that. I, I think that's kind of the recommendation we're coming up with here in Grand County. That's, that's a good thought. That's, that's good perspective. Um, all right. It is about 